Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for an incredible morning so far. Thank you to our presenters, to Janet and Amanda for making this all happen, and to all of you for being here with us again today. Um, as Brittany mentioned, I'm Annie Dean. I am better known as Walter's mom. Uh, day to day, I'm a technology executive leading remote work transformations. And I was recently traveling for work for uh, two weeks. And the night that, or the next morning after I got home, uh, Walter, who's seven years old with Kabuki syndrome, climbed into my bed, held my face and said, I love this world. Um, and I know many of you on the line are people who benefit from the love and experience of um, parenting and knowing and um, being close to people with Kabuki syndrome. And for those of you who have as a person with Kabuki syndrome yourself, thank you so much for the positivity and optimism you bring into this world. Um, you are an inspiration to all of us and the reason why we take on the work that we do at the foundation. Um, so it's always really inspiring to me to hear Janet kick off our annual conference because it's such a tangible reminder of what we want to achieve at the Kabuki Syndrome Foundation, as well as how far we've come over the past six years. Um, last year, this community helped us raise $64,000 over our two-day conference. It, that turned into more than $150,000 um, with our matching that happened last year. And what it did is it helped us fund our operations. It gave us people to focus on these challenges every single day of the year. It helped us fund research grants um, and also to invest in collaboration uh, and community infrastructure. So my ask of you right now is to help us beat that goal this year. Um, due to some gen uh, generous members of the community, we have a matching program where every donated dollar will count three times. So far, we've raised $27,000, and we're hoping that you can help us beat our goal last year by helping us raise another $72,000, helping us reach our goal of $300,000 with matching, which will keep this organization funded and working for you every day of 2023. Uh, now, I wanted to pause and talk about where we're headed for the next section of the conference. We've heard amazing speakers on the main stage today, but if you remember last year, uh, we asked all of you to fill out a survey and tell us about the things that you most want to know and understand as community members. And as a result, we're offering three deep dive discussions uh, with different experts in the field that reflect your top priorities from last year. In order to access these uh, next breakout sessions, you can either stay in the main stage or you can go to the agenda and select one of the uh, events that is happening in other uh, event Mobi rooms. And you'll do that by looking at the agenda on the left side of your menu. So let's talk about what discussions are happening. Uh, in the main stage, uh, is going to be a discussion about hypotonia. So if you wanna to listen to this discussion, stay right where you are. Hypotonia is one of the top four issues that people with Kabuki syndrome experience. Low tone is neurological and it's muscular. So today, join us on the main stage for a presentation from Dr. Emanuela Busoni and her colleague and collaborator, Rachel, Rachel Gottlieb. If you're interested in learning about Im immunology, please join us in breakout room two. Um, immunology impacts in Kabuki syndrome patients often lead to recurring infections and other uh, complications. In this session, we'll examine the root cause of immune differences and how we are exploring effective long-term treatments. Today, Dr. Sarah Potter and Brittany Spear Simpson will be leading a discussion on altered immunological development. Did anyone hear me just say Brittany and immediately go to Brittany Spears? I guess uh, that's been on my mind. Breakout number three is about clinical management guidelines. So what does clinical management guidelines mean? It means that we wanna ask ourselves the question, how do we make sure that the healthcare community has a consistent playbook for treating and caring for people with Kabuki syndrome? 
As parents and people living with Kabuki syndrome, we want to know what to screen for, what to expect, and how to best treat it. Today, Dr. Bonka will be leading a discussion on developing evidence-based clinical management guidelines for Kabuki syndrome. As a reminder, if you would like to hear the hypotonia discussion, please stay in this room. And if you would like to go hear an immunology discussion or a discussion on clinical management guidelines, please go to the agenda at left and select the rooms that are available there. Welcome Dr. Emanuel, Emanuela Gussoni and Rachel Gottlieb. Thank you for chatting with us about hypotonia. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen. I hope everyone can see me and hear me. Um, uh, thank you so much for the Kabuki Syndrome Foundation for allowing us to participate uh, at this very exciting meeting and to share some of our findings on hypotonia in Kabuki Syndrome. Um, I'm Emanuela Gussoni. I'm a muscle biologist uh, by training, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about our work uh, in the lab today. So as uh, we heard today, um, Kabuki syndrome pres can present with um, hypotonia. And the big question for me being a muscle biologist uh, has been to actually understand whether this hypotonia is a primary problem of the skeletal muscle or is a secondary problem due to a nerve conduction defect. Um, and so we basically in the lab focused on uh, understanding these aspects of hypotonia, and we use both animal models um, as well as uh, uh, patient samples through the Royal Kabuki program uh, to start addressing these, these fundamental questions. Um, and of course, the other question is, um, is it possible to reverse any type of deficiencies that we might see in stem cells or in skeletal muscle function um, in the mouse model downstream of the KMT2D mutation? And can they be somehow reversed? And so these are basic science questions in the lab that we, we started following up on, uh, and we have some data that we want to share with you today. So just a very brief introduction to show you what skeletal muscle is made of. You see right here um, a, a, a muscle that is uh, basically formed by many, many fascicles of what are called muscle fibers that you see as circles uh, right here in the picture. And each one of these muscle fibers, they're called myofibers, is actually enlarged right here. I'm taking you on a virtual tour through the microscope uh, where you can see they are basically tubes that are formed by fusion of cells. Uh, they form you know, a little community uh, and these are called myofibers. And in addition to, to them, uh, there are actually mononuclear cells of different types. The ones that I'm gonna focus on today are depicted in gray and they're called satellite cells. And these satellite cells are the muscle stem cells or the skeletal muscle. Um, here you see a little bit of a, uh, a transverse section zooming in, and you can see the muscle fiber outside here, the myonuclei that derive from the fusion of the muscle stem cells, and the muscle stem cells are here at the periphery of the myofiber. So we looked at all of these different entities in uh, the mouse model that uh, Dr. Bjornsson introduced uh, this morning uh, kindly. And so uh, I will give you a little bit of a... Um, of an introduction of what we have found. So um, this, this slide right here shows you how we isolate human or mouse muscle stem cells from skeletal muscle. We pre-weigh um, a plate, you know, and then we, we isolate the muscle tissue or we take the muscle tissue from a sample and then we mince it and digest it with enzymes, filter it, uh, and what we obtain are the muscle stem cells and the other cells that I show you in the previous cartoon, and then we're able to study them in vitro. We culture them. Um, we know about specific markers that are actually expressed on the muscle stem cells, and it allows us um, to, to enrich for these cells and, and study them uh, in vitro. So uh, the studies that I want to talk to you about um, are basically on the mouse model that I, I, I said I was introduced this morning uh, from Dr. Bjorson. And this is, this is great because um, the more we study the different systems and the same mouse, uh, the same, uh, mouse model uh, for, for uh, potential problems you know, with this mouse, mouse model, the more we're going to know how similar they are to the human disease uh, and how better we can use these models to help us develop therapies. 
Um, and so we isolated muscle stem cells from control and uh, the beta geomice. Um, and then what we did, we tested these stem cells for expansion capacity in vitro. And also we tested them for uh, ability to differentiate in vitro. And again, we did parallel um, experiments using control cells and Kabuki, um, Kabuki syndrome derived cells from the mice. And so our first question was, uh, do muscle stem cells proliferate normally in the mouse model? And so what you can see in this slide is uh, a, a typical experiment um, on how we test in vitro whether the muscle stem cells are proliferating or not. And we use these markers that you don't need to remember, but basically are, are canonical markers that are used. PAC7 is a muscle stem cell transcription marker and KI67 is for proliferation. Um, and when we looked at a lot of different mice um, and, and also a lot of different uh, cultures from these, uh, from these mice, we saw that the muscle stem cell numbers were not different in Kabuki syndrome compared to control mice, um, and that the activation of these stem cells was actually quite normal. There was no difference between control and KMT to the uh, mice. So the next question that we wanted to address was, um, is the differentiation in these muscle stem cells somehow affected? Um, and so to do this, um, we plated the cells and then allowed them to differentiate using steps that are very well established in the field. And you can see on the left side right here, um, different stages of this differentiation culture. On the left side of the, uh, of the panels, you see uh, examples of control cultures, and on the right side, examples of cultures from Kabuki syndrome mice. Um, and you see three different stages of differentiation. They are progressive. So the very first one on top is basically the exit of the cell cycle and proliferation state or, or beginning uh, of the differentiation stage. Um, and as I told you already before, we did not see any difference. Um, and this is represented in this graph right here. Uh, there is no, stat no statistical difference between control and KMT2D mice. They both express uh, the same number of myoD positive nuclei. When we begin the differentiation, and you can see the cells have started stretching a little bit more, um, and we check for the next uh, marker for differentiation of myogenic cells. This is called myogeny. Um, we actually see that uh, there is a difference, significant difference between control mice and Kabuki syndrome mice, where myogenic expression is significantly decreased in the KMT to the beta geo model compared to wild type um, uh, cultures. And the same was true when we were progressing a little bit further into differentiation where, where the cells fuse a little bit more and we allow them to form these myotubes, which basically represent the myofibers that we have in vivo in a, in a culture dish. And you can see right here how in the control cultures, we have very large myotubes and each one of these blue dots is a nucleus or a cell that has fused to form these very large myotubes. And you can appreciate right here on the right side in the Kabuki derived cultures, how there are uh, significantly less nuclei that have fused uh, in these cultures. And so you see right here that the fusion index um, in the Kabuki cultures is significantly less compared to the control mice. So what we, have, what we can attest by this is to demonstrate that there is a problem with the differentiation of these cells but not with the proliferation of these cells in KMT2D mutants. Um, we actually wanted to corroborate this, this work in vivo. And so uh, we have a way using, um, using live mice to actually induce myofiber or muscle degeneration. And then we have a way to ask the stem cells to proliferate again in vivo and reform these new myofibers. And so what we did, we, um, we induced this degeneration using a toxin. Um, and then for seven to 14 days, we allow these, um, these muscles to regenerate. And the stem cells usually kick in and they proliferate and then differentiate. And then at the end of the time, you, at this point, we checked about, about seven days, we are able to actually uh, take the muscle and then assess the size of the myofibers and whether they... Mm, whether they are uh, decreased or increased uh, in size compared to control. And so you can see from the picture right here 
that when we analyze the size of the myofiber, which uh, is basically represented by the differentiation and fusion of the cells, we also saw in vivo in these mice that the differentiation was significantly decreased in KMT2D beta geo mice compared to control. And so we're fairly confident to say that the differentiation of the muscle stem cells is somehow slowed um, in these um, myogenic precursors. The next question that we asked was related to actually the uh, neuromuscular junction. So we still have, um, it, 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 we still need to understand whether the neuromuscular junction or input coming from the nerve in these mice are actually affecting the differentiation of the muscle and if there is a primary problem with the nerve. So what we did was to analyze many neuromuscular junctions that you can see uh, stained right here on the left panels using a, a neuronal marker that you see in green and a muscle marker on the other side of the receive, uh, receiving end of the nerve um, that you can see in red. Um, and so using these two markers, we were able to look at many, many different neuromuscular junctions in both control mice and kabuki mice. And as you can see from all these graphs on the right side, we were able to actually um, assess many different parameters in these neuromuscular junctions. And most of them did not show any difference between control and kabuki mice, um, with the exception of one, which is the total stain perimeter of the neuromuscular junction here in, in red. So it looks like the size or the perimeter of the neuromuscular junction in the kabuki mice was significantly less uh, large compared to control mice. And we're still looking in, in more depth into this, whether it is, it is derived from a primary problem in the muscle fiber, or if it is due to a lack of connection of the nerve with the neuromuscular junction itself. So stay tuned. Um, the last question that we wanted to address was whether the problem is in the in differentiations that I have shown you in vitro and in vivo with the KMT to the beta geomice were actually uh, reversible. And so to do that, um, we isolated the stem cells from wild type or kabuki mice that were never cultured before. And we injected them in another mouse model that we have in the lab that does not have kabuki syndrome, but has another problem. Um, it has Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, these mice, they continuously undergo degeneration and regeneration of the muscle. So it's a very active uh, muscle um, uh, re degeneration, regeneration that allows new stem cells to incorporate in new myofibers. And so what we did, we transplanted these cells, either wild type or Kabuki syndrome derived, and then we waited 10 weeks and we assessed the engraftment efficacy of uh, Kabuki cell derived um, uh, muscle stem cells or wild type. And so uh, we analyzed um, recipient mice that were injected with either control cells or Kabuki syndrome derived cells. And basically what we saw is that there was no difference in efficiency of engraftment of the Kabuki syndrome derived cells compared to wild type, suggesting that the differentiation potential in this particular setting was completely reversed. And the Kabuki uh, syndrome derived muscle stem cells were actually as efficient as control cells um, in vivo. So this to us was very encouraging because uh, it was telling us that when the Kabuki syndrome derived cells were, when they were taken out of the Kabuki syndrome environment and put in a different environment, they were basically behaving like normal cells. And it strongly suggests that uh, whatever differentiation uh, problem is associated with the Kabuki syndrome cells, it can be reversed, leaving hope uh, for a potential to reverse this also um, in, in the Kabuki syndrome mice and eventually in patients. So what about humans and how are humans similar to what we have seen now uh, in the mice? So clearly this is an evolving uh, project and it's something that um, you know we have partnership with the Royal Kabuki program. Um, and we started looking at a few uh, of the samples that were donated for research um, of human patients that have Kabuki syndrome. Um, and you can see that um, Right here, you have a control muscle where the myofibers are very nicely shaped uh, and they're very tightly packed with one another uh, and the nuclei are at the, are at the periphery. And the rest of the images are from patients with Kabuki syndrome. 
And the most striking difference that we have seen is presence of this material that I'm pointing at right here in pink. Um, and uh, it is basically it was basically found in every single one of the Kabuki patients. And we think it's this is fibrotic material that is the positive. And we actually have not seen this uh, in the Kabuki mice. Um, so the take home message from this is that we are learning a lot using these mouse models, but we always have to keep in mind that not 100% of the findings that we see in the mice are shared with the humans. And so parallel studies of, uh, of mouse and human muscles are crucial uh, to help the research moving forward and understand what um, is similar and what is different in, uh, in the two systems. So in conclusions, uh, I just told you about the, fib the fibrotic tissues that we have seen uh, with uh, normal muscle tissue in human uh, kabuki tissue patients. This is something we are actively studying to understand what is, what is going on and why there is a difference and whether um, there are some particular progenitors within the muscle that are over-proliferating that give rise to this fibrosis. Um, we are also actively trying to understand why uh, the muscle cell differentiation seems to be impaired or delayed in, in vitro, both in the mice and in humans. Um, and we also want to actually replicate the studies that we have done uh, with the Kabuki muscle cells um, in using mouse muscle cells in, in using human muscle cells and see if we can uh, reverse any type of uh, di differentiation potential uh, that we might see in, in those cases. But again, we need more samples to, um, to do these experiments. And you know, through the Royal Kabuki Initiative, we are, um, we are gaining access to some of these samples. So last but not least, I want to thank the people who have helped us um, getting all this research possible. A big shout out of Alec Wright, who used to be in my lab and did with me all of the experiments that I have presented today. Uh, but I also want to introduce you to um, uh, my new lab members that are actually working on this project, actively working on this project. Uh, this fellow uh, on the side here is uh, Konju Zhao, Dr. Konju Zhao. He's a postdoc in my lab. And, and right here, you see Jadon Brown, who is a technician in my lab, and um, they're actually working on Kabuki syndrome right now in my lab, and I hope they will stay for many, many years. Of course, I have to thank the Royal Kabuki program um, and all the different members who have been uh, totally supportive of this project um, and uh, helped us with resources and, and, uh, and advice uh, over the years and Cincinnati Children's Hospital um, that actually collaborated with us for the work that I have presented today. And none of this would be possible without the, collab without the collaboration of uh, patients and families. And so a big shout out to them too. Um, last but not least, uh, we all know that all this work can be done with, uh, with support. Um, and I'm really thankful to NIAMS um, who has awarded to us uh, a grant for studying these uh, Kabuki syndrome muscle stem cells for uh, the next four years. So hopefully we will be able to generate some more exciting data in the future. And, um, and we can talk about this in future years. Um, so with that, I am actually delighted to introduce you to um, our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Rachel Gottlieb from uh, the Royal Kabuki and, uh, program. And she will actually tell you a little bit more about how you can participate in this research and help us um, uh, with your support. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Manuela and Kaya for giving me a chance to talk a little bit about um, some research opportunities. Let's see. Okay. So my name is Rachel Gottlieb. I am the program coordinator for the Kabuki program here at Boston Children's Hospital. So who are we? Um, we're a team, a multidisciplinary team of specialists um, that provide clinical care for patients with Kabuki syndrome of all ages from around the country and internationally. We also have an ongoing research study that looks more at different aspects of Kabuki syndrome with one of our biggest goals being developing targeted treatments and therapies. Since our inception in 2017, we've enrolled 113 families into our research program. Some of these families are clinical patients, but you don't need to be a clinical patient to participate in research. So I'll talk a little bit more about how you can get involved in that as well. 
So there are some things you can do from the comfort of your own home, such as answering questionnaires, submitting medical records to be reviewed, and also participating in our new speech study. There are also some things that can be completed here during a visit to Boston Children's Hospital. Um, one of those being neuro neuropsychological testing and muscle impedance measurements, which look at muscle activity. Um, as Dr. Cusoni mentioned, we also collect biological samples as well. Um, those can be done locally and sent to us or while you're here at the hospital. One of them is blood samples. So those can be standalone draws or we can piggyback them um, on a clinical draw. If you're interested in doing that, let us know one to two weeks in advance so we can send you a kit and then also our lab can prepare to get those samples back. And then we also collect discarded skeletal tissue from clinical procedures. So if you're interested in submitting a sample um, of that nature, let us know three to four weeks in advance so we can coordinate with your surgeon and then send you any materials so we can collect those as well. Um, so if you're interested in participating or learning more, you can visit our website um, at royakabuki.org. We also submitted some um, flyers and our research brochure that have more information. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about the program um, and answer any questions you might have. And I look forward to connecting with some of you in the near future. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you so much, Emanuela. Um, Emanuela, I'd like to invite you back to the stage. Um, we have uh, about five minutes for some Q&A, um, actually about 10 minutes for some Q&A. And so we've got a lot of questions regarding uh, dietary interventions. Um, the questions state, are there current recommendations to take supplements for muscle tone for Kabuki syndrome? Do supplements like L-carnitine help with hypotonia or muscle function? Okay, so I think that these questions are better addressed with the clinicians in the group. Uh, I mean, if, if somebody wants to contact Dr. Bodamer in our group, I'm sure he will answer these questions. Uh, but, you know, clearly I am a PhD. I do basic research. Um, I I can throw a guess, but I, I'm not allowed, you know, to recommend, you know, one or another compound. So the medical questions um, should be referred to um, to the physicians in the group. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, understood. And and we do just um, for the folks in this uh, chat room, we do have um, a bank of questions for Dr. Bodmer, so we'll absolutely add those. Um, and maybe he can shed some light with regards to some of the drug screening um, initiatives at Roya Kabuki. Um, the next question we have is, does hypotonia change with age? Yeah, this is a very interesting question, and it's something that uh, we would like to address. Um, so we have, if aging is, is, is a process that requires aging of the mice as well. Uh, so mice can live up to two years or two and a half years. And so the, the latest that we, um, we studied the mice now is about 10 months. Uh, but we have a colony of mice here at Boston Children's Hospital, and we actually have uh, generated or we have imported some more colonies, uh, both with KMT2D and KDM6A mutation, and we're planning to age these mice and address these problems with aging as well. So that's, that is something in the works. Again, um, we just started this work last year, so we have to age the mice before we can, uh, we can do this. And in humans, um, the only way we can do this is to actually by studying uh, control tissues that are age matched with um, with Kabuki syndrome derived tissues, um, and so this requires um, analysis of a lot of samples that um, you know take the same type of muscle uh, and are the same age and also gender because um, you know humans obviously are very different from mice. Mice are inbred, and we need to match um, co create cohorts of group of. Um, of tissues that are, are similar so that we can compare scientifically one and the other. Thank you. Um, a lot of uh, individuals with Kabuki syndrome uh, take physical therapy. And there's a question on if drills, physical therapy drills or exercise um, can help individuals eradicate or mitigate hypotonia. Yes. Um, so I would not, um, 
I would not say that, you know, these people should uh, do strenuous exercise, but clearly uh, exercise is, is known to be helpful for, uh, for fighting hypotonia. Basically, um, if there is a little bit of exercise, we are helping the muscle stem cells stay in function. Uh, if there is a little bit of muscle damage, these muscle stem cells will activate and keep the muscle alive. So, um, you know, muscle is one of those organs that we say use it or lose it. Um, and so this is good for everybody, regardless of whether they have Kabuki syndrome or not. If we stay active, we will maintain it. And so, um, again, no, nothing too strenuous, but, um, but in, in good measure and in, in, you know, in moderation, it's, it's totally recommended. Um, does hypotonia occur in every muscle in the body or are only some muscles affected? Outstanding uh, question. So uh, it, this is what we're trying to understand. Uh, we're focusing, um, you know, first in the mice, you know, to see if there is some, some type of slow muscle or fast muscles that are more affected in the mice. Um, and uh, in humans, it becomes more and more difficult because, um, you know, one, one with the functional assays, they can be assessed. So maybe, uh, maybe some, of the, some of the studies in patients will address this, uh, but it is, it is possible that depending upon how the nerve connects with the muscle and how much firing there is, and then how the muscle receives these signals from the nerves, there could be differences in uh, hypotonia manifestation in different muscle types. So that's, a, that's an outstanding question. Uh, for example, the, our eye muscles are very, very fast, uh, while other muscles in our body are very, very slow. And so we will address these questions using the mouse models. And uh, hopefully, um, you know, we will be able to, uh, to also study some of these uh, questions in humans. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question here that's asking if Kabuki syndrome interrupts the messaging or the signal from the brain to the muscles, uh, similar to um, what stroke victims might experience. The individual knows what they want to do, um, for example, handwriting, running, gross motor, but the muscles do not respond efficiently. Is that an accurate um, response? And if so, what therapies can work to improve that communication with the muscles? Yeah, this is a, this is a fundamental question in the lab. And so uh, what we are doing, we are actually comparing um, studies in mice that have a mutation in every cell in their body, um, you know, the KMT2D model that Dr. Bjorson has, has generated. So presumably they have, you know, they have the mutation in both the nerve and the muscles. Uh, with Kabuki mice, they have only the mutation in the muscle. And we're going to address, by comparing these two models, we're going to address whether there are deficiencies that are only due to the muscle component or if they are due only to the neuronal component. Uh, one can play the game and say, okay, so we're going to leave the muscle component intact and just do the neuronal and see if the muscle is affected. Those strategies are also possible. Um, and so all of this is, is focus of research. And these are all excellent questions that are, are clearly, clearly need to be addressed in the field. Thank you so much. We have time for one more question. Um, do you know if there is uh, any effect on growth hormone on the improvement of muscle strength and hypotonia? So I know that growth hormone has an impact on muscle growth. Um, whether that is a is playing a role in Kabuki syndrome, I do not know yet. So I don't know of any group right now that is studying, but that doesn't mean that is not happening. So hopefully it is happening. The more the merrier. We need help. <laughs> Great, thank you. And actually, just one final question, and and maybe Rachel can can hop on. Um, how do I get samples to BCH or Roya Kabuki? Yeah, great question. Um, so if you want to send some samples our way, feel free to reach out to me directly via that email or a phone call, and we would send you a kit in the mail that you would, you know, collect a sample in, and then it would include um, return postage, return um, mailers, and you would just send it right back to us. Great, thank you so much. And also there is some additional information for folks um, in the navigation menu under research recruitment for additional information on Roya Kabuki program. Um, Dr. Gusoni, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us for this deeper dive conversation. Um, for those whose questions have not been answered today, we will certainly get those questions to the team at Roya Kabuki's and we will follow up with you all.